This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by GardenCourses.com. GardenCourses.com offers online horticultural training for those looking to develop their own home gardens. There are three courses available online this month, Small Space, Big Harvest, Creating an Urban Wildlife Garden and Four Seasons of Colour in Your Garden. Go to GardenCourses.com to find out more. This episode I'm speaking to Professor Jeff Ollerton, author of the brilliant new book Pollinators and Pollination. Another must-have to add to your ever-burgeoning reading pile, I'm afraid. I love the book, and as you'll hear during the interview, it threw up all sorts of interesting questions about pollinators, their role in our lives and gardens, and how much we need them. Jeff was really generous with his time and knowledge, and if you enjoy this interview half as much as I enjoyed recording it, you are in for a treat. So my first question is, um, and I think maybe it's not as straightforward as you might think, um, what is a pollinator? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, and, and um, it often it isn't a straightforward answer to uh, to describe what a what a pollinator is. And, and I think to to really understand what a pollinator is, you've got to kind of step back and think about the plants themselves. Um, and plants, unlike most animals, um, don't move around to find mates. Um, and so in order to uh, to engage in sexual reproduction, uh, they actually have to uh, bring in uh, what we term a pollen vector, something that moves pollen around from one flower to another. Uh, and for some plants, that could be uh, wind. Uh, so anybody who suffers from hay fever knows that um, you know, a significant proportion of our plants in this country are wind pollinated. Um, and for some water uh, inhabiting plants, uh, it could be uh, water currents that are moving the pollen around. And there's a, there's a few species that, that do that. But for the vast majority of, um, of plants, it's actually animals like insects, but also you know, in the tropics, things like birds and, and bats and so on, that act as, as pollinators. Uh, and they're moving the pollen, they're moving the, the, the pollen which contains the male sex cells from one flower to another um, and enabling those plants to, to reproduce. So that in a nutshell is, is what a pollinator is. Um, we can unpack that a lot further and, and talk about the different groups of pollinators. We're all familiar with bees, but actually um, there's a much wider diversity of, of pollinators out there, ranging from everything from flies to butterflies to moths to uh, birds and bats, which I mentioned, but also lizards, rodents, some monkeys act as pollinators, uh, and even cockroaches in some parts of the world. Hmm. So I was going to say, apart from being nice to look at, why would gardeners want pollinators to visit to visit their gardens? I'm not sure about the cockroaches being nice to look at. But, uh, <laughs> apart from that, the yeah. majority of them, I think, are quite popular. But yeah, what what benefit do they bring to gardeners? Uh, well, the cockroaches don't pollinate in this country. They're they're um, they're mainly uh, tropical. Some examples from Asia and uh, South America as well. Uh, what benefits do they bring? I, well, I think um, I mean. You know, let's let's not um, uh, you know just dismiss the idea that they're they're just nice to look at. I mean, you know, the, the, that I think that is an important thing. I mean, who doesn't like to see butterflies and and bumblebees and so on in their in their garden? Um, but from a purely practical perspective, um, you know, anybody who's grown things like runner beans. In their garden, uh, or apples, or you know other other um, top fruit, or raspberries, for example, uh, knows just how important it is to have uh, bees, in particular, visiting those flowers and pollinating them. Um, you don't get a, a decent crop from from many of our um, insect pollinated vegetables and fruit unless you've got uh, those pollinators coming into the garden. Um, but also for gardeners who want to save the seeds 
from um, um, annual plants, for example, uh, to propagate them again next year. Um, bringing pollinators into your garden is going to be important for for many of those plants as well. One of the experiments that you do in the book, and there are many interesting ones, but I was interested in the one where you go into the field and you cut the heads off of the scabious flowers. And I think what you found was that removing the sources of nectar from many of the flowers didn't actually mean that there was a scarcity of food for the, the pollinators who regularly visited that site. So from that, could you extrapolate that actually more flowers wouldn't lead necessarily to an increase in pollinator numbers? Just mean that there was more more food kind of across the area. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you you picked up on that uh, that experiment. Actually, it was uh, it was the first time that anything like that had ever been attempted, uh, and I, I recruited a, a, a group of, of students who who helped me out with that. And um, in one day, we hand pulled um fourteen and a half thousand flower heads um from from those flowers. I mean we didn't you know get rid of the plants, we just removed the flower heads and they, they regrew. Uh we had permission from the wildlife trust to do it. Um but that we calculated that actually the fourteen and a half flower heads of field scabious amounts to half a litre of nectar per day. I mean, it's an enormous amount of nectar. For most flowers, nectar is 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 measured in microliters. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. What what happened was that uh, it made absolutely no difference to the number of pollinators on the site. Uh, all of the bees and butterflies and, and hoverflies just moved on to the next most abundant um, plant on on the site uh, and, and and took nectar from from there. Uh, so yeah, that that probably is telling us that there's enough nectar at that particular site at that particular time to accommodate all of those those pollinators. Um, but it, you know, it, uh, if we done it, uh, if we done it on another site, we might have had you know, very different results. Um, but I think in terms of attracting different kinds of pollinators. Um, it's diversity of flowers which is important rather than abundance of flowers. Um, so if you uh, fill your garden with one particular type of flower, um, only those insects that can access the nectar or, or access the pollen, if they're pollen-collecting bees, uh, on, on those flowers um, will be able to 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 visit the flowers and, and will be attracted to the garden um whereas if you have um a hundred different types of flowers um you you get many more different types of uh, of pollinators in in the garden um so it, it i think it's a balance you you've got to have sufficient numbers of each different type of flower to make it worthwhile that the insects actually come and visit those those flowers, um, but you don't want to fill your garden with just one or two different uh, different flowers. Yes, oh, and, and again, you mentioned the structure of different flowers and, and the different types of pollinators that they attract. And one of the things that you 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 mentioned in the book, which I found really interesting as well, was the um, the very dark floret in the middle of the um, white head of a white of a wild carrot flower and um nobody really knows why it's there um but if it is redundant if it was kind of I, I think it's assumed it's redundant and it maybe had a use historically but if it if it was redundant would we find species across the wild where it no longer occurs and and is that the case yeah yeah again it's interesting that you you picked up on on that example um so so it was Charles Darwin actually you know writing in the the middle of the nineteenth century who first you know looked at at wild carrot flower heads in in detail and and uh, as you say there's this very dark modified flower in the middle of the flower head uh, and he speculated about what its function might be and suggested that um uh, it, it, it may not have any function now. It might be an evolutionary hangover from a, a time when it did have a function. Um, and yeah, back in the early 2000s, we did some experiments where we added artificial 
um, purple flowers to the to the heads or, or remove them and, and so on. And it made absolutely no difference to to visits by insects or or seed set of those those flare heads. Um, there are so if you go into a a, um, a population of uh, wild carrots anywhere in in Britain, uh, you'll find a proportion that have the dark central floret and a proportion that don't have that floret. Um, and that proportion varies. Um, in some populations, almost none of the plants have it. And in other populations, all of them have it. And in others, half of them will have it and half of them won't. Uh, and that's the same across Europe where um, where, the pl- where the plant is, is you know, it's native over a long area, a uh, large area. Um, so uh, that uh, that's probably also evidence that you know there's no real function to to this. Just some plants have it and, and some plants don't. It's a difficult one to really uh, come to a conclusion on uh, because I, I think the experiments of the of the kind that we conducted need to be done in more parts of the world uh, across the natural range of of wild carrot um there's been a few other since we published that work in uh 2000 there's been a few other um studies done like that dave goulson who who um, some of your listeners probably uh, will be familiar with uh he's done some work with some students in portugal and they suggested that perhaps the the dark central flower was actually uh, mimicking some beetles which were visiting the uh, the inflorescences. But uh, I, th- I think it's a really good example of how quite a common plant that's you know familiar uh, in in grasslands across Europe um, still has um, a story to tell us. There's still mysteries there about how it um, how it reproduces uh, and how its flowers have evolved. And um, that's true across the flowering plants. You know, there, there's what 350,000 species of flowering plants out there, and, and my best estimate is that we've got some kind of information about the pollinators, but perhaps 10% of those, and you know, less than 1% have been studied in any in any real detail. So there's there's still lots to discover. Yeah, I think that's what drew me to that actually, because it is it is a bit of an unknown, and like you say, it's so, it's so easy to see an example of it. Um, and I think that a lot of gardeners have been taught maybe across the years that actually that is a guide for pollinators, uh, that that dark floret. But um, kind of thinking about other guides that pollinators might use, I found it fascinating uh, that you. Um, spoke about how some pollinators navigate via lin- linear features in a landscape. Um, and, and I wondered what that meant for plants that were situated near these features. Mm, yeah, that was um, that was work that uh, one of my former PhD students, Louise Kreimer, uh, did um, some time ago now. And, and uh, yeah, what she found was that um, if you follow the behaviour of uh, bumblebees and butterflies and hoverflies uh, as they're approaching um, hedgerows and, and other linear features within the landscape um, they'll turn and they'll start following those uh, those features uh, and by following I, I don't mean that they're foraging on the flowers within the uh, within the hedgerow I mean, and clearly they do that they'll follow the hedgerows and use them as a navigation guide. Um, and the best analogy we've got for, for that is that's the way that light aircraft pilots often navigate around uh, around Britain. So a light aircraft pilot who wants to fly, say, from London um, up to Sheffield uh, often doesn't get a, a map out. They just follow the M1 and, and head north. Um, and we think that's what's happening with, uh, with these these. Uh, certainly bumblebees do it and, and um, some butterflies and some hoverflies as, as well. Um, and Louise did some really elegant experiments where she she placed out plants uh, within the landscape uh, at points where different numbers of hedgerows came came together. Uh, so, you know, where perhaps one hedgerow 
uh, came in. She put she put a plant at the end of that, uh, or where two hedgerows joined, or, or three or four or five joined at the corner of the field. Um, and what she found was that the more hedgerow connections there were, the greater the number of insects visiting the flowers, and the greater the amount of seed set for for those flowers. Um, and so I think what it means for um, for plant populations across the across uh, Britain, uh, where populations are often quite sort of fragmented, they're in small fragments, small patches around the landscape, is that if we can build in more hedgerows or hedge banks or um, linear patches of, of habitat, we might actually be able to increase uh, what we term gene flow, the amount of, of genetic exchange between these uh, fragments of uh, these population fragments, uh, and also the increasing amount of seed set for rare plants in, in particular. What struck me, I think, reading the book and also, I suppose, reading around the subject a little bit is that obviously hedgerows um, are man made, meadows are man, if not made, then managed. Um, I suppose they are man-made to start with. Um, then you have things like bees like to nest in piles of sand and, you know, kind of open habitats. Um, and all of these things suggest that, and, and I think it's been written, that the uh, most biodiver- maximum biodiversity we've had in the UK came in around about, I think, the middle of the 1800s. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I will look it up. Um so what that says to me is that actually pollinators are at their maximum when when kind of activity by humans is at a maximum or or certain activities by humans is at a maximum. So is it fair to say that if we go back, you know, a long time and we would have been pro- probably in this country mainly woodland, is it fair to say that pollinator numbers have kind of evolved alongside humans and that maybe we you know, we've co-evolved together to benefit each other? Uh, it's a really great question, um, and I, I, I've got well, there were two answers to that. First, first of all, you know, we, we absolutely have no idea. Uh, you know, we can speculate a lot, but we we simply don't have um, good data on numbers of of pollinators, uh, abundance of pollinators, diversity of pollinators uh, beyond about the the beginning of the nineteenth century. So that's when, when you know, the real sort of scientific and, and natural historian study of, of pollinators really, really started. So prior to that, we don't have uh, very much uh, really good information. And, it, and even in the early 19th century, it's very fragmentary. Um, there's a, one of the chapters in, in the book, um, actually, where I talk about um, declines in pollinators and, and so on. I start it with a, um, a poem called Wild Bees by John Clare, who was uh, uh, based in, in the part of, of Britain that I'm based in at the moment, Northamptonshire. And he was called the Northamptonshire Peasant Poet. Uh, and he writes uh, incredibly eloquently and, and, and very in great detail uh, about the, the natural history around him. And in this poem, Wild Bees, he talks about four different species of bees, which actually, from the descriptions, we can we can identify. Three of those bees are still really common. One of those bees is now extremely rare in this country. Um, and it suggests that when he was writing this, this poem, probably in the 1820s, that bee was much, much more common. But it's you know little fragments of history uh, and 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 uh, little observations like like that which we're relying on to to go even back to the beginning of the nineteenth century. So before that we we don't really know. But <clears throat> what my other answer to this is is that actually it's a bit of a myth that Britain was completely covered in woodland um, before before humans arrived. Um, Actually, we know now. It used, that used to be the you know, it used to be thought that that was the case. But actually, we know now that there were open areas of uh, of grassland uh, and almost like mo- more like a sort of a um, a savanna kind of habitat, temperate savanna. Uh, but that was being 
um, produced by the large um, um, herbivores, uh, you know, relatives, wild relatives of, of cattle and of sheep and so on, that were wandering around in, in Britain at that time. Um, so estimates of the amount of, of woodland cover in Britain uh, before humans arrived um, vary you know, between sort of 50 and 70 percent woodland cover, and the rest of it would be much more open kind of habitat. Um, and of course, you had um, wolves and, and lynx and so on, which were also affecting the behavior of, of those herbivores. Um, which, which again would have would have affected the structure of the uh, of the vegetation there. So uh, there's no doubt that now we have less woodland than we would have had, you know, say five thousand years ago, six thousand years ago. Um, but whether we have more pollinators now because of that, I I, I think not because uh, you know seventy percent of our country is is agricultural, uh, and though we know that in a lot of agricultural areas, for instance, uh, pollinator numbers are relatively low because of the kind of intensive agriculture that uh, that many farmers are um, are using at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I have read a lot of things about the. Um, coverage woodland coverage and i think it's quite a contentious issue isn't it um yeah. I, I, I think it's argued either way um but talking about um particularly pollination of food um yeah. obviously we are not managing things particularly in the favor of our pollinators at the moment um you know do how how damaging will it be from a food growing point of view if numbers decline further well, in Britain, it, it, it's interesting that there are not many good examples of where uh, decline in, in pollinators has, has affected um, food production. Um, there are some some good examples from apple orchards where we know that if, if in some apple orchards, at least, if they had more uh, pollinators in those orchards, um, they would have greater fruit set in the, in the orchards but but quite often for for apple growers um they don't want a maximum number of fruit they want good quality fruit um and they're willing to trade off you know large numbers of apples for better quality apples um but again pollinators play a role there uh we know that if if there are more pollinators in an apple orchard on on average you know the fruit uh, fruit numbers go up, but fruit quality improves as well. The, the fruit are larger um, uh, because there are more seeds in them. For uh, for some of the other um, insect pollinated crops, things like field beans and and orchid rape and and so on, I'm not seeing any published evidence that loss of pollinators is is playing a role in in the yields reducing. Um, but I, I don't think we want to um, want to get to that point. Um, you know, we we want to manage our landscapes to have as as high a diversity of pollinators as as possible, uh, without getting to to the point where we're suddenly really concerned about it. Um, we know that pollinators and number numbers have have declined overall, um, and there's something called a precautionary principle. Which you know says that that you really don't want to get to the point where things have become critical uh, before you start to take action. Uh, you know, climate change is a really good example of that. Uh, we don't want to get to the point where climate change is having a massive effect on uh, on the earth before we start to take action. Uh, we want to take action now to to stop that happening. And I think the same the same applies to pollinators as well. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting because I, you know, you're you don't sort of scaremonger at all with the book, but you, but you do, you know, highlight the problems. And I think a lot of people would be interested to kind of find out that actually, I think a lot of people think that after World War Two, we lost a lot of biodiversity in this country for various reasons. Um, and then I think that you say actually the main period of of species loss happened just after World War One. Can you just maybe touch briefly on why that was the case? Because I think people will find that really interesting. Yeah, well, World War Two certainly had had an effect, but the um, I think the point I'm really making in the book is that um, 
the, the, the main period of, of pollinator extinction in Britain, we've lost about um, uh, 23 species of, of bees and, and flower visiting wasps. Um, but the main period of, of those extinctions started just after World War One. I. I mean, it continued through and into into World War Two and and just afterwards. But it started much earlier. Um, and the reason was because um, you know during World War One we had the same sort of of issues around um, food security, um, around not growing enough food in this country to to feed the population, problems with imports and so on, and blockades uh, by by the um, uh, by the Germans at, the, at, at that point, that all of that happened in World War One as well as in World War Two. Um, but to some extent, we've, we've kind of forgotten about that. You know, World War Two is relatively recent history, but it's it's kind of receding into the past. World War One feels like you know much more ancient history um, because uh, the generations that that went through that have have, have gone now. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's. I think we've got to look even you know further back in time to see how things like changes to agricultural practice, um, intensification, and so on, um, have had effect over over time. Um, so yeah, so you said um, that I didn't don't scaremonger in the book, and and uh, yeah, absolutely. What you know, my job as a scientist is to present the evidence. Um, and uh, to interpret that evidence in a in a way that is is you know balanced and nuanced and and so on. Um, and though I've a lot of concerns about what's happening to pollinators in Britain and and globally, you know I'm not going to stand on a soapbox and say all of the bees are dying and we've got to do something about it, um, which some of the environmental organisations are um, are doing, and. Um, there is a um, there is a phrase that that I, that I use in the book. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use it on uh, on your podcast, uh, which is the honeybee bullshit machine, um, which is you can edit that out. No, if you want. no, you um, can absolutely swear on this podcast. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the honeybee bullshit machine is is um, is a phrase that I that I coined, which. Um, it doesn't relate, you know, specifically to people who keep honeybees and beekeepers and and so on. It's rela- it refers really to um, some environmental organisations that have, uh, you know, run campaigns around save the bees or, or, or you know large companies and and supermarkets and so on that have read you know these campaigns around save the bees and and um, have you know, misquoted statistics or made up statistics or, you know, use the, the, the famous Einstein quote of, you know, if all of the bees uh, on the planet were to die, uh, humanity would only have five years left to live. There are various versions of it. You know, first of all, it's not true. Um, there are 20,000 species of bees on, on the planet and, and honeybees are just you know, one of them. Um, but also Einstein never said it. You know, it was made up um, probably in the 1950s by someone in a, uh, who used the quote, in a, in a beekeeping magazine uh, at a point where, Dahl, uh, where Einstein was at his most famous. Uh, and they wanted to, to say that Einstein said this about bees. And actually, he didn't. He, you know, it's, it's completely untrue. Um, these are just sort of examples of, of you yeah, know, this, this um, honeybee bullshit machine. Some people call it bee wash. Um, it's it's you know just just the, uh, the there is so much misinformation out there and that you know that's one of the reasons for for writing the book actually which is to produce a a more balanced uh, and a nuanced view of what is of what is happening to our to our pollinators. Mm, it's naughty as well because um, I remember going to an industry event and there was some honeybee bullshit going around and um, you know everybody in the audience was was really loving it and they really kind of thought that because they want to do good and so yeah. if you tell them they can do good by doing this then they can't and these yeah. are industry professionals like tradespeople from the world of horticulture and design and and they sort of thought yeah this is great and be, like I say because people want to do the right thing and so they. Yeah. You know, it's it's naughty to kind of mislead people when they they're trying to, you know, 
express good intentions. Um, it is, yeah. I mean, it's it's in a sense, it's almost kind of kind of fraudulent. My, my favourite example is there is a website where you can um, you can sponsor a honeybee. It's an American <laughs> website, and I think you pay a dollar to 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 sponsor a honeybee. Now, you know, worker honeybees only live a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to you know pay a dollar every couple of weeks to, oh. to keep sponsoring them? I mean, it's it's just crazy. And, and actually, what's what's often not recognised is that you know, particularly in parts of the world where honeybees are not native, like North America and South America and Australia as well, honeybees can actually be a real conservation problem. Um, because they suppress the numbers of native bees and other pollinators, they you know monopolize all of the nectar and pollen within a within an area. Um, and, so, and that's something I touch on in the book. You know, some of us got real concerns about this growth in uh, beekeeping um, in uh, globally. You know, honeybee numbers have gone up and up and up and up globally. You know, honeybees are not going to go extinct anytime soon. Uh, but some of our other bees and, and other pollinator species may well do. Yeah, and actually, I think that that sort of ties into one of the other questions I had, which was that you know, I think ideally you would like to see a maximum amount of habitats to kind of cater to lots of different pollinators. Um, but then, yeah. obviously, we have um, pollinators who are specialists who need very niche habitats and feeding sources. So, um, you know, can those two things coexist? Can we protect one while trying to maximise the other? Um, I, I think they can. Yes, I think they can. Um yeah, it, it's a difficult balancing act to to make. But you know, what the, the big thing within uh, British conservation at the moment is the idea that uh, nature reserves have got to be um, larger. Uh, they've got to be landscape level. Uh, they've got to be connected together to allow species to move move between them, and they've got to be appropriately managed. And you know, appropriately managed either means humans going in and doing the managing, or um, you know, the buzzword at the moment, of course, is rewilding. You know, adding beavers into into landscapes and letting them effectively manage the uh, watercourses and and, and uh, the landscape in in that sense. Um, if we have large enough nature reserves, large enough protected areas that are genuinely protected and 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 where we we you know they're not threatened in 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 the uh, in the future, um, I think we can accommodate both you know a, a diversity of of um, of pollinators, including you know, many of the generalists, like you know, some of our bumblebees, um, and the specialists as well. They can find a um, a place, a habitat, a niche within within there. Um, but there's you know there's there's lots of discussion in in the conservation um, uh, amongst professional conservationists, you know, the wildlife trusts and RSPB and so on, about how we can make our um, landscapes more more wildlife friendly and, and gardens certainly have a, a a role to play in that absolutely um because we can't you know humans are part of nature and we can't dissociate one from 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 the other um and particularly in a fairly densely populated country like britain um people have to be part of the equation yeah and and actually that's another really interesting experiment that you did in your book which was um uh, measuring the pollinators that visited a particularly large garden and i think that obviously there's Jennifer Owen's study that she did um well going back i think to the 60s um so i did wonder though about the kind of the validity of measuring the amount of pollinators in a garden and whether we could take from that that it was cause for celebration when actually it wasn't because in gardens obviously there are lots of different sources of of nectar and pollen and they're kind of like a banquet they're they're like uh, i think i said describe them as a mcdonald's on an a road they're you know they're full of food um and is it is it possible that we're measuring the, the number of pollinators, but actually all we're getting is just all the pollinators from the kind of local area piling into that one spot? And, and therefore, does the garden give us a true picture of the amount of pollinators in an area? Yeah, no, that's a, re that's a really good good question. Um, so that was another pick of my PhD students, Hilary Aaronler, um, who, who did that work. 
Um, and she, as you say, she looked at pollinator diversity in, um, I think it was 19 different, you know, large country houses, big posh stately homes um, around Northamptonshire and Bedfordshire. Um, and, um, you know, what? so there's, there are two reasons for, for us doing that, that study. One is that those gardens... Um, have been there for centuries in many in many cases. Uh, they're relatively stable um, parts of the landscape in in this part of part of Britain. Um, okay, the, you know the, the the style and the format, and the type of planting, and and so on has, has certainly changed, but nonetheless um, they're they're relatively stable uh, elements within within the landscape. In contrast. The farmland around them that they often sit in has changed enormously in the last hundred years or so, uh, with you know agricultural intensification as we've we've discussed, you know, great monocultures and and so on. Um, so it was really to you know to kind of understand whether or not these gardens could act as um, ecologists use the term refugia. So refugia are areas where wildlife um, migrates back to uh, in terms of sort of ice ages, for for example. Um, species can, you know, m- move into areas that are, that are uh, not being affected by, by the ice or a little bit warmer and, and so on. And then once the ice disappears, they, they then move back out into the landscape um, and recolonize. And so these gardens effectively could be acting as, as refugia for, for the future. Uh, that um, they, they've got very high pollinator diversity, and when we start managing the surrounding landscape um, in a more in a way that's more sympathetic to wildlife and to pollinators in particular, they can then move out of um, of those habitat of, of those gardens into those other habitats. Um, because actually, you know, many of the um, of the insects that that Hillary was was finding in those gardens. They'll probably spend almost all of their life cycle within those gardens. Um, small um, solitary bees, um, for example, um, you know, may spend their whole their whole lives nesting and um, foraging for nectar and pollen uh, within an area of of you know less than a hectare. Um, some of the largest species, bumblebees and so on, can forage over. You know, over kilometres, uh, but the smaller species certainly are, are much more restricted. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think they are important areas, and and likewise, um, uh, gardens within uh, you know urban housing developments um, and so on. Often we you know we think um, that that our own small small garden uh, probably can't do very much for. Uh, for supporting pollinators, um, you know, at the moment I'm looking out of out of bedroom window, and um, I'm looking at our own garden, and it's only ten meters by by twenty meters. Um, it's looking a bit dreary at the moment in this weather, um, but but our garden sits within a wider, you know, Victorian development of gardens, which is much much larger, and you know. Some of uh, some of my neighbours don't do very much to their gardens. Uh, they've got a patch of, of brambles at the back, and they they might mow the lawn once or twice a year. Uh, others are much tidier uh, and and plant lots of, of annual flowers and, and so on. Um, and at a landscape scale, if we consider this to be the landscape of the of the gardens, we're all contributing to that. We're all contributing to supporting. Um, not just pollinators, but birds and, and other wildlife here. Which I suppose brings me to my last question very nicely, which is if you could give maybe a few top tips for people who want to encourage pollinators um, and the things that they maybe could do and the things that they shouldn't do if they want to maximise the visits to their gardens, could you could you give a few handy hints? Um First of all, think carefully about the kind of plants that you put into the garden. Um, you know, there, there, there are many different types of, of plants which will attract um, pollinators. 
Um, the RHS has a, um, a really good website um, called Plants for Pollinators, uh, which has some uh, you know ideas for for what to plant in in gardens. Um, but when you're choosing particular varieties of of plant. Um, you know, choose the ones which have a single flowered, you know, trying to avoid some of the fussy double flowers and, and so on, uh, because uh, often pollinators can't get into the to the nectar and pollen and those sorts of flowers. Um, when you're visiting um, a nursery or a, or a garden centre, and hopefully in the not too distant future we'll be able to do that again. Um, when you when you're visiting those, um, watch out for for bees and butterflies. Have a look and, and see what they're they're visiting in in the nurseries, and perhaps make you know choices for for what to plant in the gardens based on uh, based on that. Um, other things you can do: uh, try not to be too tidy, um, particularly in 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 the winter. Um, a number of our pollinators hibernate over winter. Uh, and um, they can, uh, you know, they can they can find um, places to, to shelter. Uh, then then that's great. Um, oh, other things. Um, try and have a, some water in the garden. You know, often small ponds and and even you know very small dishes of of water we know will attract you know different types of wildlife. Um, but uh, quite a number of of uh, bees, for example, need a source of of water um, because they they um, some of the mason bees, for example, use wet mud and wet soil to seal up their um, their nests, um, and and so the, there needs to be water, at least you know, wet mud and soil within within the garden to allow them to to do that. Um, uh, be nice to wasps as well. <laughs> What's <laughs> my final one? Wasps, you know, get a really bad press. Uh, but actually, wasps are really important pollinators, particularly later in the season. Of things like ivy, uh, and of course, if they don't pollinate the ivy, then there aren't berries, um, uh, which um, uh, which then feed birds and so on. Uh, but also, wasps are really important predators within the garden. Um, take a you know, range of different caterpillars and sawfly larvae and so on from uh, uh, from ornamental and, and vegetable plants. And if you're not convinced about wasps, go back and listen to episode 74 with Richard Jones and find out why they're so important to have around. There's a link to that episode in the show notes. A very big thank you to Jeff for the interview and thanks to you for listening. Rather generously, the publishers have provided a discount code just for you, which gives you 30% off the price of Jeff's book. If you follow the link in the show notes or go to Pelagic Publishing's website and search for pollinators and pollination, you can use the code ROOTS30, all uppercase. Thanks as well to GardenCourses.com for sponsoring this episode. And I leave you with Dr. Ian Bedford with the most appropriate bug of the week. For most bumblebee species, the new queens that emerged the previous summer will have spent winter in deep hibernation. All the other members of their colony would have died And so during spring, it'll be just these new queens that we see buzzing around our gardens, searching for nectar to replenish the energy that they'll have lost through not feeding for six months. After a couple of weeks, though, they'll be fit enough for the vital role that they'll play in ensuring the survival of their species. This begins with a quest to find a nesting site, somewhere protected from the elements and hidden from predators. Depending on species, this could be in a hole in the ground, within dry leaves under a hedge, or even in a bird box, or high up within the cavity of a tree. But wherever the queen chooses, they'll all begin following the same behavioural process. A process that's been undertaken by many millions of generations before them. The first stage of this requires the queen to collect pollen which she mixes with wax from her body to create a mound within the nest that she'll lay a few eggs on. She'll also collect nectar that she stores in a wax pot that she builds next to the mound. Then, just like a bird, the queen will sit on her eggs, keeping them warm 
by vibrating her muscles to create heat, whilst feeding from the nectar pot to maintain her energy. After several days, the eggs hatch into little white grubs that begin eating the pollen mound. Then, as they grow bigger, the queen will maintain them on pollen she forages for from nearby flowers. The grubs then mature in a couple of weeks and create cocoons, within which they develop into the first batch of adult worker bumblebees, which are all infertile females. Their job is to now relieve the queen of her foraging work, enabling her to remain within the nest for the rest of her life, laying eggs whilst being fed and protected by the workers. As the season progresses, the colonies grow to their maximum size, yet rarely containing more than four to five hundred adult workers. The queens, however, will soon be coming to the end of their lives, so to ensure the generations continue, they stimulate some of their eggs into becoming new queens, whilst others that had remained unfertilized develop into males. When these eventually hatch into adults, they disperse from the nest, leaving the maternal queen to die and the colony to end. Flying away to find mates, the males will also soon die, whilst the new queens will feed on late season nectar, storing energy reserves that will help them survive through the winter hibernation and allow us the pleasure of watching them buzzing around our gardens again the following spring. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.